Um, thanks for the opportunity to present. I really enjoyed Jeremy's uh, talk. It was very inspiring. And I think it um, reinforced to me some of the things that I want to talk about today from my perspective and the perspective of, I would say, UX. Are there UX designers in the audience at all? OK, there's a good. <laughs> there's a brave soul here from UX. Um, so um, my talk is the coevolution, um, coevolution, the U UX, and uh, the changing relationship of human intelligence and, um, and machine, uh, machines, AI, let's say. Um, there's a bit of a background, but just to add a little bit to that. Um, so I'm a UX designer. Uh, my main interest is health and medical, uh, data intensive uh, work. Uh, I've gotten more recently involved in cybersecurity, which has some very interesting and somewhat similar problem sets. And uh, when I was invited to talk today, I was thinking about um, what I do, UX design, which I would say is a, one way of putting it is it's helping to uh, strengthen and improve the relationship and understand the relationship between humans and the machines they work with, the computers they work with. And as Jeremy was pointing out, that is changing at an amazing uh, clip right now and in ways that are sort of mind boggling. For me, as a UX designer, I think the most important, uh, by far significant uh, development is this, what I'll call artificial intelligence as an umbrella term, but uh, deep learning, all these sorts of technologies and approaches that are emerging. You know, thinking about those in relation to um, human beings and how we're going to create interfaces or interactions that are going to really work in the future. So for the, this talk, I was reading an article about um, humans in a loop, uh, which is a term referring to thinking about uh, improving machine learning with humans, sort of getting that extra, the last mile, the last little bit, really kind of fine tuning that system. And it's a super interesting, that's anyway, as, as I understand the term. But it got me thinking more about uh, other loops, the sort of larger loops, the human uh, intelligence and machine intelligence loops. And what are those going to look like? Uh, and it seems like to me that those loops are going to get much more um, tight, intertwined, and subtle. It's going to be harder to differentiate. I think right now people have a lot easier time knowing what the machine is doing and what I'm doing. But even this uh, example that uh, Jeremy mentioned this morning about um, suggesting uh, email responses and all that, you know, who is doing that? It's the machine, but it's, it could have come from you. It's getting blurrier and blurrier all the time. Um, so from my perspective, uh, and I have a little bit of bias, I suppose, but the, the crucibles of this sort of evolution are the interfaces and interactions, um, of which there are many, and that these interactions are going to drive, um, to a certain extent, the development of this relationship between human intelligence and AI. And um, it really is becoming more and more of a two-way street that people are looking at displays, um, interacting with them, and responding to them. By the same token, uh, the machines that they're looking at are looking back at them, in a sense. They're studying the users and figuring out what they need and what they want. And, to, in, in their own way, basically uh, adapting to them. So it's sort of like a, you know, we're, we're looking at each other in, in much more kind of equal footing. And the, each of those interactions drives probably further development in one way or the other, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, so I was reading an article last night, and there was a, a phrase that really struck and I think is really true. Organisms or algorithms, um, you know. And I was, you, know, you think about it, you know, we're basically we're set a, a code sets um, that are uh, primed to help us, you know, uh, adapt to an environment. There's a certain level of so this is uh, we could all probably could tell a, a double helix DNA. 
Um, so that's got the, the codes that tell us, um, you know, tell us what to do, basically, or how to operate and how to respond. Um, there's a certain level of stability in that code um, and predictability, but there's also room for variation so that we can, over time, adapt to changing environments. And I think the same thing is true, obviously, for, for um, algorithms and computer code, that there are some com there's a basic structure there, but over time it evolves and adapts, and more and more it's adapting to um, the environment. It's in adapting to things that we don't really directly manually control. So I just think there's an interesting parallelism between these two. Um, the biological organisms have been adapting primarily through environmental pressures, uh, selection pressures, uh, whereas um, uh, in the past, I think more so, uh, code has been really much more directed. Now it's also adapting to an, a different environmental pressures and behaviors of the people who are using it. So we've got these two, let's say, entities or organisms of a sort um, that are now in this tighter and tighter relationship. And I have a biology background, and so I was thinking about um, this idea of coevolution, and it, and it sort of un, unleashed a lot of thoughts in my, my mind about this whole subject. So um, basically, coevolution in, in a simplified form is when two or more species interact with each other and reciprocally change uh, each other. So in this case, um, this is a, I think a, a buff-tailed uh, sicklebill hummingbird. Um, and you can see it's got a very unique shaped bill or beak. Um, and then there's this flower of which I not sure the pronunciation, and I don't recall exactly, but uh, that's its partner, basically, in, in evolution. And you can see that there's quite a, um, almost as if it were designed, um, I don't believe in intelligent design, but uh, you can see that the shape of the beak and the shape of the flower are very um, suited for each other, and the idea is that, that the, the bird is able to get the nectar from this flower very preferentially, it's very well suited to get it, and that by doing so, the flower is able to pol spread pollen on this bird, which can then pollinate other of its uh, uh, plant brethren. So in coevolution, uh, there are a number of different types of relationships. They don't always have to be happy, good relationships. They can be, um, they can be bad for, for one of the partners in that relationship. Um, so this is a kind of a basic uh, kind of grid of, of how that works. So you have uh, uh, one organism benefiting and the other one not, um, maybe like a host and parasite sort of situation. Um, that's one thing, that's antagonism. Uh, you've got uh, competition, say different predators or predator prey, and um, mutualism. Uh, which is both organisms benefit from the uh, interactions and, the, and the, the evolution that happens between the two of them. Um, as one example of that, uh, there is a, a little fish called a, a goby and a, and a shrimp um, that's pr pretty much blind. They're a completely different species, very orthogonal to each other in most respects, but they actually sometimes will take up residence together inside a, a, little, a little space. Um, and the, uh, the, the goby has sight, and it will allow the um, shrimp to go about and do its thing. But it will, when the shrimp is in trouble, say if there's something going on in the environment, the goby will see that and get the shrimp protected. The shrimp, in turn, helps the um, the goby by providing closure and bringing in food. So there's sort of a reciprocal positive relationship. And I think for UX design, um, those kinds of interactions are the things we want to have happen. We want to have these, uh, these positive mutualistic react, uh, uh, sort of uh, encounters and evolution, at least drive towards that, and less potentially of the sort of uh, uh, competitive uh, uh, computers winning and humans losing kind of scenario. 
I think mutualism is very possible <laughs> in a lot of cases. So, as I said, when I thought about uh, coevolution, a lot of ideas kind of spilled out. And um, I wanted to talk about a few of them. Um, I, I'm still thinking this through. Um, but I think it provides a framework for a lot of different directions uh, for thinking about the relationship between uh, humans and computers. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about feedback loops, uh, different types, and uh, what that might mean. Stimulus response, um, you know, how people react to the output of machines. Uh, relating to that sort of learned behavior um, and how that can work for us or against us. Um, the Red Queen effect, which is uh, basically something which I'm noticing a lot in the cybersecurity space, um, and it's a, a problem of this uh, rapid evolution, essentially. Um, mutualism, overdependence, and over specialization, and then thinking a little bit about machines and biological evolution. So, feedback loops. Um, there are many types. One classic example is a predator-prey relationship. And one thing that's really important about this sort of very basic relationship is there needs to be a certain type of balance. Um, if, it's, if the advantage goes too much to save the predator, um, they'll wipe out all the prey, and then ultimately that will wipe out the predators. So while the relationship may change over time and the predator may be in the ascendant at certain periods or the prey may be in the ascendant in other periods, there has to be at least enough to keep the system going. So uh, that's a, there's a feedback loop involved there that um, can either be in balance or get out of control. This is from a an example of a, a positive feedback loop and uh, the dangers potentially of a positive feedback loop. This is an example um, uh, from a book that I really like called uh, uh, Universal Principles of Design. And it was talking about um, feedback loops and unintended consequences. So they used an example of football helmets. And in, I believe, the 50s, the helmet was very soft and there was a lot of head injuries. So they said, let's come up with a better solution for that. So they came up with the plastic helmets that we all are familiar with, um, which makes sense. It's a better technical solution. Um, but then there's the human behavior aspect of that, which wasn't necessarily factored in. And that is that the players felt more protected. So they were therefore um, more inclined to take greater risks. Greater risks meant that the injury rates actually in some ways went up, and maybe the severity of, the, of those injuries went up. So it's a kind of a, a feedback loop that we don't necessarily want. And then so maybe we make the helmets harder and all this, and then they, pe people take more risks. In this particular case, um, it may be that it's not just continually improving the currently existing design of the helmet. It's thinking about a different helmet altogether or a different approach. And actually, with the uh, news about concussions and so forth in NFL, that, um, uh, that that's, going to, that's going to change. There's going to have to be a rethink, that there's a limit to this cycle of just improving the helmet. We can sort of see that thing. There's a time where maybe it's just going to drop off. We just can't, we're not going to accept um, traumatic brain injury and so forth, uh, that we have to find a solution technically or behaviorally. Uh, also, negative feedback loops, um, you know, thinking about how to time things so that the human interacts in a way that it makes sense. This is a little bit old example, I think, at this point, but, uh, uh, you know, using segues and sort of adjusting segues so that, um, so that people are able to control them better and not overcompensate and undercompensate. Same thing is true for, say, fly-by-wire uh, aviation that the machine helps to sort of tamp down overreactions uh, to the technology by, um, by humans. Um, I think yet another kind of interesting example that's related to that is the idea of anti-lock brakes. Um, it's a great technical solution, but there's a, there's a habit, especially of the, uh, of the maybe older among us or 
um, some drivers. When you, um, anti-lock brakes essentially, um, you, you know, the machine is handling some of the braking. Um, and so when you, you apply the pressure to the brake pedal, you should keep a consistent pressure and let the machine help out. But I think some of us were conditioned back in the day to pump the brake. Pumping the brake is not the right solution, but that's a sort of an old behavior. So in a sense, what we're doing is we're conflicting you know, our relationship, our expectations, what we predict the system's doing is not what the system is doing. So we have to sort of relearn, and, and in another way, the system has to help us maybe to, to do the right thing in spite of ourselves so that it's a maximized system. So um, feedback loops in data and uh, intensive applications are happening. So feedback loops between machine learning and human intelligence, human analysts. This is an, a pretty basic example of, a, say, looking at a, a fraud in a network graph that's been generated by some data, data that's being presented in this visualization. And on the right, the um, human analyst can then say, yeah, that makes sense, or, or it doesn't make sense. Like, this is um, a very quick and dirty way for the human to be in the loop and, and put in the human perspective judgment on what the, what the machine is seeing. And then the machine takes that information and then, uh, you know, depending on what the, the human has specified there, may reinforce this or may remove it, say this is not a, a connection that matters or it's fine, I know those people. So that's an example of a feedback loop now. Um, I look at this kind of thing as, as useful, important, and necessary for the time being, although I also think it's very transitory. I think there's going to be less and less of this kind of, of thing. It's, it's still quite manual. Looking at this sort of visualization and then putting in your comment about that and then doing another one and another one, um, I think the machines are going to be much more uh, adept at figuring this stuff out and just coming out with <laughs> the right answer immediately. But in the meantime, this is a, a, a necessary step. So in feedback loops, um, you know, we think about the predator prey or the human machine as, you know, the, the pretty much those are the, the, the important characters, but it's also the environment in which they operate. So in the predator prey relationship in the natural world, um, there could be some sort of alternate um, uh, force that upsets the balance of relationship between those two. So maybe the um, the coyotes are all shot by, by hunters. Um, therefore, that, that's a perturbation in that feedback loop and the, the prey animals uh, explode in population and you have then potentially a crash. So it's not just considering the feedback loop uh, between the two kind of main actors, but the environment in which they operate in. So for example, in the cybersecurity type application that I was looking at, we are just looking at a minute ago, um, the feedback between the human and computer is one thing, but also thinking about more broadly, what is the data coming from? Uh, you know, what is a person doing with this data? Uh, how, what action do they take? It's not just about that immediate interaction of this is good or that's bad to the computer. It's what do I do with this information? So it's an environmental perspective as well as um, a perspective on just the, the two actors. So because there's an um, increasingly entwined, intertwined relationship interaction between humans and, mach and machines, so we're just looking at there's this machine collaborating with a human saying, here's a, a network visualization of potential fraud. And the, the human is saying, yeah, that looks good or that doesn't look good. This is um, happening all the time. Uh, uh, um, kind of very intense basis. And I saw this quote and I, I kind of, I, I think about this. Um, this is a sort of a subtle co-evolution that we're spending so much time kind of in this machine world, or some of it, let's say security analysts or medical researchers, that um, potentially we start to think, lose the way we think about things or solve problems. So a security analyst, may have been doing something a certain way, and they don't necessarily know how they do it, but they do a certain way and they get the results they want. 
But now and more, they're sort of looping into this sort of kind of um, programmatic way of doing things, partly as a result of the way UX designers and others have designed these systems. But a lot of times, the people who've designed the systems that these analysts are working on are data scientists, UX designers, and others who don't really have the domain expertise, um, which is a, that's something that Jeremy brought up, and I want to get back to that. Um, they don't have the expertise, and they don't have that way of thinking about it. So basically, they're in a box in which that's been created by people who are not them, or, the way, or their sort of way of thinking about things. So I think there is a danger that we become more kind of uh, regimented, in a sense, in the way that we think. It's not an insolvable problem, but it's just something to, to consider. Um, I, did a, I started doing a little grad work in neuroscience. I love it. I think it's really interesting, but at least in my belief, um, we don't really know that much about the brain yet. We're learning more and more all the time, but it's still it's quite a black box. There's still much to learn. We're learning about computers, but, I, uh, um, but again, I think with this all, uh, deep learning and technologies like that, we don't understand necessarily what's going on under the hood either. And now we've got the combination or collision or um, interaction between these two things, which we really don't understand that well at all. Um, you know, what is the effect that uh, the machine display, the machine is having on our cognition, our perception, our thinking? Um, there's, let's just say there's many studies, who knows what it all, how it all turn out, but almost certainly it's affecting the way we, we think in certain respects or how we perceive things. It's changing us, and we're changing it. Um, so say one example of that is the sort of idea of um, we get something, we put something back out. Uh, right now, I work in, in areas where there's a lot of data flooding people. There's no way that they can keep up with the, the volumes, basically. Um, so they look at dashboards, data dashboards that have a lot of information, most of which is pretty much in, um, not actionable in itself. And they're just left to sort of figure that out. And they've also got a million other distractions along with that. And um, I think one of the things as far as like making, evolving our relationship better is dealing with this thing called alarm fatigue or the alarm problem, which is basically overloading um, humans with too much information to process and do anything meaningful at once. Machines are great at going through the data and pulling up a lot of interesting anomalies and interesting patterns in the data, but figuring out which ones of those to present in the, in the right time is a problem, at least currently. Um, you know, it, probably many of you are familiar with this, but if you've ever been to a hospital and you, you go to an ICU and you hear all kinds of buzzers and alarms and all kinds of noise going on. And um, I think human beings, by their nature, they're, they're evolved to tune the non-critical things out, essentially. They tune into the things that are really important. But when there's a lot of things that are all saying they're important, you end up tuning all of it out. So in the case of um, you know, hospitals and medical devices, uh, monitoring devices, you know, the, it turned out in some places, for example, that the more alarms that were going on, the worse the response time was. Probably not a surprise. Um, and, you know, basically you shut off the things that really matter. So if there's an alarm that actually counts, um, you don't hear anymore because your brain is basically habituated to it, which, it, as it should. Um, we, could, we can't respond to all stimuli all the time. That would, that's not a very adaptive, um, uh, not very adaptive in the natural world. We need to focus on what's important. There's a lion <laughs> over in the bushes. As soon as we see that, know, know it and, and, and respond the best. Doesn't matter what else is going off, there's a bird tweeting. But in this, in this kind of new world, there's a lot of things crowding for attention. Um, so I think about design, and I'd start with a simple example. Um, smoke detectors. We, uh, we kind of know what to expect. We, we know what we want from them. If there is smoke in the, in the air, we want them to make us aware of that. It doesn't always work. Sometimes you burn your toast and it goes off, but basically that's what we expect. 
and it was designed that way. Um, so smoke, loud noise, maybe a red light or whatever, it's, that's a signal, that's, that's important information. We could have designed the system, the smoke detecting system, to just say everything is fine every five minutes. We could have said that's cool, that's good, you know. Um, uh, that obviously would not make a lot of sense, it wouldn't work too well um, over time because we'd habituate, wouldn't even hear it anymore. And, it, and for other reasons, we don't, there's nothing we should do about it. Um, now we've got a lot of systems that are detecting all kinds of interesting data out there and sort of showing it to us, a proliferation of detectors. And uh, the, the, the problem is that a lot of them, at least in, this, in the work that I do, I see dashboards that show the sort of like everything is fine, everything is fine, everything is fine, or not important information on, say, this dashboard. So um, I end up um, trying to sort of remove that and reprioritize. So, you know, I, dashboards that look kind of like this or data that sort of like this, where there's some very useful information in there, but there's also a lot of things that are really unimportant. Um, so, it's thinking about at the interface level how to make that information prioritized and accessible. So, you show everything, but you show it in a way that actually makes sense from a user human perspective. Um, and,. Uh, as simple and obvious as this seems to be, if, uh, you know, I don't think it's practiced as much as it should be. Um, so I was talking about um, learned behavior and things like habituation and, and learned behavior and what to expect, like from a smoke detector, you hear a loud noise, you, you generally are going to think there's a problem, I've got to get out of the building, or at least you're going to look into it. It's a learned behavior, um, which is great. That's kind of what we want. But in the, again, in, the, in a lot of the work that I see, um, learned behavior can be kind of a double-edged sword, um, especially based on visual cues. So this is an example of um, coevolution uh, uh, and, and mimicry. Basically, the, there are certain kinds of butterflies which are poisonous or toxic to birds. Uh, they don't hide the fact that they exist. They don't hide the. F they actually want to show show themselves with bright colors. They want to say, "I'm here. If you want it, go for it." But you're going to get very sick or die if if you do. Um, so that's a very powerful adaptive technique. Um, other butterflies have quote figured out that if I look like a poisonous butterfly, but I'm not a poisonous butterfly, I can get a free ride here. I can, I can avoid predation. And I'm relying on the bird's kind of predisposition to avoid doing that, to eating the poisonous butterfly. So they're free riders. Uh, the problem, of course, not for, that, not for the non-poisonous butterflies, but for the birds is if they eat the, the non-poisonous butterflies, they learn that their, that color doesn't really make any difference. The next time around, <laughs> they see another one that looks like that, they'll eat it and get sick or die, and so will the butterflies. So it's a bad outcome for, for, <laughs> for at least two creatures there. Um, and sometimes I feel like, in a strange way, the same thing is happening with uh, data representations, data visualization, or showing data. People kind of learn to trust data, uh, and they see charts and graphs, they see dashboards, and they kind of believe them without much question, without much challenge. They're just there. They look slick, they look good, they look like they're, they're quantitative. Um, and I've seen this more and more u misused. Um, so you may have some valid data, say, on the left for something. And then you've got something that looks exactly like it on the right, which is really poor. And say, <laughs> you consume the thing on the right, you're going to be a sick bird, basically. Um, basically, you've, you've been habituated to trust these things because they look the same, but they're not the same. So um, it's a great evolutionary tactic on the uh, part of uh, people who may not want to do the, the full work or have kind of bad purposes for their information. I guess fishing would be another example as well. We were habituated to opening things, looking, uh, looking at someone sending us a link and clicking on that. So 
that's just a res sort of stimulus response, and a lot of bad actors are out there kind of using that sort of immediate learned response. So how do we help people n maintain a certain level of convenience and, um, and flow in the world without uh, having them eat the bad butterflies? So um, another uh, kind of aspect of coevolution and a term that comes up in that context and is also true, I think, in, in some of the work I'm doing is this called the idea of the Red Queen effect, which is from Alice in Wonderland. And basically, the Red Queen tells Alice, it's all kind of looking glass world, and so everything is kind of backwards and reverse. So, um, so the Red Queen tells Alice that they're running, 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 but they're not getting anywhere. And um, basically, she's like, the Red Queen tells Alice, you have to run as fast as you can just to stay in place. And um, I feel like that's true for a lot of things, especially in the world that um, I'm inhabiting right now, which is uh, cybersecurity. We're running, running, running to try and keep up with, um, say, the predators out there in the world. And um, we're, we're not even keeping up. We're actually falling behind. Um, so. Um, you know, we're using techniques like machine learning uh, to help kind of look at all the network traffic, all the anomalies in network traffic that might be suggesting um, potential attacks. But there's no way to keep up. There's absolutely no way to keep up with that. So um, I kind of look towards um, machine learning uh, with, with hope that maybe we can get beyond that. But of course, the predators and the prey in the situation both have access to technology, so uh, we'll see. But it seems like kind of a dead end, in a sense, or sort of a, a static with, the, um, with uh, the attackers basically always having the advantage. Um, so you know, I kind of look at uh, the design challenge right now is thinking about this sort of very integrated, embedded system where you have in the machines, you have deeply embed, you, you try to embed some level of human judgment, and you know it's already in there because people created the system, at least initially. And on the flip side, you have um, you know, human beings and looking at the thing through means like data visualizations um, and, and interpretation, and then feeding that back to the, to the machines. Um, the, the thing is that this is not static. I think every design that I come up with now probably will be irrelevant in a couple of years, and I actually I hope it is. Um, I think there are fun problems to solve, but the, at the rate at which design, um, the technology is changing, um, the designs we're working on right now, I would expect to be irrelevant in, an, say, relatively near future. So, you know, there may be some sort of common kind of goals, but I think the means to get them are, are not going to be the same. And so, uh, you know, um, designing for uh, systems that really amplify humans is not going to be a single interface design. It's going to be having the machines basically look at us and understand and adapt to us to a certain extent, to observe how we're doing, where we're making our mistakes, or maybe we're doing things, and kind of raise those, those points. So. Um, it's still working. Um, basically, it's more, I almost think of like a human collaboration sort of style where um, the machines are actively paying attention to us and saying, uh, you know, what are you doing here? Or, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, you know, the, that the machines are kind of good listeners, you know, that they, they actually pay attention. They're not just some sort of like, dead thing there that we enter information into, um, that they challenge us, that they present information that we may not have thought of. So we're not just sort of looping in our own um, kind of stuck way of thinking about things. Uh, and push things out, offer suggestions or predictions or kind of other ways of looking at it. So I definitely, uh, I'm more and more thinking about not human computer interaction, but sort of like a quasi-human, quasi-human interactions, if I could put it that way, and that the interactions will be guided more and more by the experience. In fact, I think user experience design has never been a term I've loved, but it's a term of art right now. But I, I think about it more as sort of 
user computer experience design. Because the experience the computer has of the human is going to be important as, as well as the other way around. So if the human doesn't, the human perceives something on the screen and, or misperceives it, puts in bad data, the, that's going to be bad experience for the computer. Bad experience for the computer is going to be a bad feedback loop back for the human. So it's a, a, a vicious cycle in that sense. Or potentially it could be a, a virtuous cycle depending on the quality experience. The quality experience can be guided by good design, by making sure that you know, it's as lo low, um, little manual input as possible, low uh, potential for um, errors as possible, and, um, and, uh, and maximizing things like challenging assumptions or making us think about things in a different way. Um, I talked about cybersecurity as being um, basically it's it's a uh, it feels a little bit bleak right now. Um, the 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 balance of power I think is in the hands of attackers versus uh, defenders. Um, but you know in in, in biology and in evolution, uh, asymmetries and sort of problems create new opportunities to for new types of species. In cybersecurity. Um, there are um, a proliferation and abundance of tools now to help defend. Um, probably most of those will go away uh, or may not survive, but there's all different ways of approaching the problem by um, offering these different sort of prototypes out there. Just in the natural world, different animals will uh, be born. Some will survive, some won't. Uh, this proliferation of different types of, of uh, data-intensive applications will um, lead to some interesting filling of niches and so forth. Um, uh, I don't have time to go through this slide too much, but um, this is a, 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 something I saw a couple of days ago I thought was quite interesting as, in, in relation to sort of um, um, diversification of um, uh, different types of human computer interactions with machine learning. And basically, it's showing how in this, um, in this uh, gr matrix here is grid, um, that certain types of uh, areas will be, um, uh, will have different uh, importance. Like, so for example, you want your machine, you, you want your, your reaction, interaction with the computer to be predictable, and also you want to make sure that um, the cost of the mistakes, you know, are within a range that's comfortable. So if something is unpredictable and there's a high risk of mistakes, then probably, at least for the near term, you're not going to want to have 100% the machine's doing it. If it's low cost, um, pretty predictable, that's great for machines. Over time, that dynamic, dynamic is going to change. Um, yeah, I want to take time for questions, so I'm going to skip to the next. Uh, I do think, sort of philosophically anyway, that there, there is a potential of, of dependency and over-specialization that we can't function in the world without the machines that we're creating. In a way, they augment us, make us super powerful, but also um, there's a certain fr fragility potentially in a system like that. So if this specialized uh, flower the mo uh, and moth dynamic where the moth has a long um, tongue to feed, if that's gone, maybe this flower is going to suffer as a result or go extinct or vice versa. So there is always a danger in specialization in, Dependency. Um, maybe the last thing I'll, I'll well, the last thing I'll say on that is that uh, that there's actually you know we've talked sort of an analogically or metaphorically about coevolution of uh, the relationship between humans and machines, but I think there's also sort of a very direct kind of impact that machines will have on evolution potentially, which is um, now with things like gene editing and uh, you know, nanobots that go inside of our, our, our body, that can go inside of our, our bodies and clean our, our arteries and so forth. Things like mate selection, match, okay, Cupid. That, that there's going to be actually a kind of a direct relationship between biological evolution and, and the ways that um, we develop our computing systems. I have no idea, but I just feel like um, that along the way that humans 
um, will have a say in how the outcomes of these are. I, don't, I think right now we don't understand the systems that well, we don't understand the brain that well, but we can at least interact with these two systems. We can manage these systems a little bit through interactions and through interfaces. So as machines become better equipped to, uh, to take care of themselves, I think maybe we can spend a, more time than we currently do in thinking about those relationships and managing them, and what do they look like. Um, the outcomes I don't think are deterministic. I don't, I don't know the dire predictions of the machines taking over or losing our jobs. I just think we can shape the direction. And ideally, the main uh, outcome of all of this will be that we have a, a very powerful, um, liberating experience uh, that helps cure cancer, that helps elevate art. All these things are possible, but I think the way to get there is by thinking about the interactions over time and what we do over the next five or ten years in terms of interface design. Thank you. If there are any questions. Yeah. Um, um, I'm actually your anti-lock brake system uh, is kind of a good example f uh, for uh, what kind of system we should design. I think instead of uh, react to um, the situation you slide, uh, you uh, keep the machine will pedal for you. Actually, it should be more collaborative, as you said. Depend on the person who is doing, maybe push down all the time, or maybe he's just jerking the, the car already. The system, if it's smart, it should react. I think then become more collaborative in a sense, right? I think probably that's the way we can think, even for human with a machine in the future. When machine is capable of doing a lot of things, maybe instead of replacing people, make them assist the people with different skill to be able to perform uh, the same task of the same quality that we need. Then maybe for the sake of we are doing something machine is capable of doing, at least the, system, the world is in good order, not going to have a disaster because then a lot of people lost job, then you will have a disordered uh, world. That's my thought. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's a very good formulation. That's sort of the case that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make here at a high level. Anything else? Okay, well, thanks very much. Appreciate it.